this uh, teach. I love teaching this class because I had so much experience with foreclosures. Uh, <clears throat> I had my my the top of my career, let's say. No, when I started getting really active in real estate and was doing most of my business, um, and I felt like I was I was really like making it happen was during the foreclosure crisis because all of a sudden the price of homes went to a <clears throat> place where any one of my friends could purchase something. So I kept dragging people out with me and saying, you got to come look at this house with me. And so I uh, sold a ton of foreclosures. And so I wanted to just walk you through on the buyer side, because you probably will never get a chance in your career to uh, work on the seller side of a uh, foreclosure is just to explain the basics because, and it's funny, I was looking at when I taught this class last and it was 2019. And even in 2019, when I was teaching it, I felt a little awkward because the market was doing really well. It's like, we don't have a lot of foreclosures, but I, I'm not saying the market's tanking. I'm just saying that you're going to start seeing things in the market that you haven't seen in a few years. So I thought it's a good time to kind of get you prepared because I hadn't been heard it, hearing questions in years about foreclosures and now I do. So um, you have to, first off, I'll explain why you're never ever going to have the chance to be on the seller side of these until you go into them, it, it, unless you go into foreclosures. So on the seller side, it's all about relationships and your relationship is with the bank, right? So there are uh, traditionally in a market, let's say 20 years ago, 20 years ago in any market around anywhere but a metropolitan area, you had, let's say there were 300 agents in the Durango area. There were two that worked with banks and they had 1% of the listings. So you have the regular market and once in a while you saw a foreclosure and it was always listed by one of these two people because they happened to, one of them worked with Wells Fargo. One of them happened to work with Chase, like whatever it was, like they had those relationships where they'd be the ones that would be working for these companies, like as the listing agent, right? And then um, all of a sudden, 2007, eight, nine, the foreclosure crisis happened and these agents had like 15, 20, maybe not 20% of the market, but a lot of the market. So you had these people who you felt like they were really good at foreclosures and representing their sellers. They might not be good agents at all. Like they'd never get back to you, things like that, but they had a lot of business. And now it's back to where, you know, once in a while you might see one coming through. Um, but you always wanted to be on the good side of the people with the listings, like don't make them mad because you will see them in the future. They're, they represent the banks and they don't do a lot of other business. I know um, back in the day, it was this lady, Kathy, Kathy Kraft, Kraft her. I don't think she's in business anymore. She's probably retired, but Bob Thorne as well. And Bob Thorne, um, it, yeah, very active out in the Vicedo area. So Julie, you might've run into him. I, I love Bob, but Okay, so that's why we're not talking about the seller side. But for the buyer, I can't stress enough that you need the right type of buyer if you're going to purchase, have them purchase a foreclosure. So the kind of buyer that I'm talking about is not someone with a lot of anxiety about purchasing. They're relaxed about everything. They're like, it's no big deal. I'm getting a deal I'm, or on the price, right? So back in, um, at some point, I remember hearing that when you have a short sale and you're purchasing a home that has a short sale going on, that's like when it's on the way to foreclosure, you're not saving that much money. There isn't like that, unless you really like the house, there wasn't, you weren't saving a bunch of money, but on foreclosures, traditionally, you know, you're getting five, 10% off on the home. There's a lot of hoops you have to jump through in order to get the home at a better price, right? So your person is getting a deal. You have to be able to keep reminding them there's a reason you're buying a foreclosure, right? You want to get a good price. So if the bank's asking you to jump through all these hoops, like just do it. So if you have that kind of buyer that's like, yeah, I just want to get a good deal. I'm really looking for, um, I love fixing things. And uh, they they really want to be that person that says, wow, I put 30,000 into this and I have a really nice home now. But they also have to be able to come out of pocket at least a thousand or $2, at least. I'm like, maybe even 2,500 in today's world if they want to get to closing because they're going to have to pay for everything and they might have to just bail at the end and not say, oh my God, I'm going to lose this $3,000. Like you have to just be able to walk away because if it's not, if it ends up not working out or there's more to it going on than you knew, then you have to be able to walk. And if you know that that buyer that's saying, hey, I'm thinking about foreclosures is not the right buyer. You have to be able to 
explain what the process is like, thus my class, so that you can kind of advise them that it might not be a great fit because they don't know this coming in. They just think it's a regular house purchase. So, and also break in if you have any questions. This doesn't have to just be me talking. Uh, so then you also have to make sure it is the right property and that you're actually getting a deal on it, depending on what's going on with that particular home. Just remember, when you see a home that's in foreclosure, there's a reason it's in foreclosure. So what happened uh, in the home? Is it, is the reason, usually people don't just bail on their homes and leave it to the bank. Something happened in that house. Like, sure, if it was like some drug house or, or something where the people who owned it, uh, they, they couldn't think straight then maybe they just totally bailed on the house and it's a beautiful house in a great neighborhood, but usually that person has tried to sell their home and it didn't sell. So maybe they had it on the market too high and they just weren't getting reasonable. They didn't have an agent that was able to talk them down, uh, but usually it's the distance it was from town. So let's say it's super rural area and they just couldn't get it sold because there was something about it that people just didn't wanna buy the home. Uh, also make sure, so the, often it was in disrepair uh, and they just couldn't, didn't have the money to fix it up. And it just like in a normal market, most buyers don't want to go and take over a home that's in total disrepair, right? They want, if it's market value, they don't want to put a bunch of money into it. They just want to move into a house. Like most people just want to move into a house, but also make sure that your buyer isn't one of those people that just wants to buy a foreclosure to say they bought a foreclosure. There are people like that. Like, I just want to say I bought a foreclosure. So they could, they get emotional about it and they see there's a foreclosure and they go, oh, I'm going to go write an offer on that. And you're like, this does not suit you at all. This is in the, this is like, you got two little kids and you just told me that you wanted to be close to downtown or, you know, they want to be with their friends and you're buying something, let's say in our area, it would be Timberdale. Like it couldn't be further away in our county or Vista del Oro. And if you don't know the subdivisions, it's because they're like 50 minutes from downtown Durango on like 30 minutes worth of dirt roads and there no cell phone service. Like just make sure that when, if you know enough about your buyer and they're looking at something because it seems like such a great deal, like make sure it actually, they're gonna be happy in a year. It's not uh, something that they think that it's just gonna be like a, a, just this wonderful experience and you're not there to counsel them off the, the proverbial cliff, okay? So that all should make sense, but often, what you get in uh, foreclosures, like I, I, I've had, unfortunately, I've had sellers that have ha literally handed the keys back to the bank, uh, bad divorces, couldn't sell their home, couldn't agree on what it should sell for. And they just tell me, I just left the keys in it. I'm leaving it to the bank. So that person that I know that left it to the bank was like two years before the bank put it on the market. So think about all the things that happened in that home in Durango, Colorado during that two years, all the pipes probably froze, right? Um, the people who are going into foreclosure, especially if they're in a, you know, they, a, a lot of these are people with kids. They're horrible situations when people go into foreclosure. They're so angry because it's their home and they've lost it. So they pull things out of the wall and, you know, you'll have a buyer that goes into a foreclosure. I can't believe people live like this, or I can't believe people did this to their home. Like, well, imagine what that's like. So people have spray painted on the walls. They leave, um, water running, like a lot of people are in a serious distress and they're pissed off at the bank for taking their home away, especially in the foreclosure crisis. So these houses have been literally trashed, okay? Um, doors left open in the middle of the winter, things like that. Uh, so what kind of experience are they gonna have to go through in getting that house, especially if the pipes have frozen, how much work that's going to be to, to get it back to normal? So you might not notice these things because eventually the water was turned off, but you turn that water on and it's going to start flooding the house. They're going to have to like pull walls out and stuff like that. So um, also be very aware of what loan your buyers need to get. If you're dealing with people with cash all day, okay? Uh, but if you're dealing with somebody that needs an FHA loan, they need, uh, I don't know much about VA loans, so I'll, but I know they have a higher form of uh, appraisal they need to get where it has to be in better condition. But if they have a loan, where it's less than 20%, uh, I shouldn't even say that. I've been out of the market too long. It's If it's not a conventional, like I am putting this much down, 5% down, uh, it's something like USDA, FHA, you're not going to be able to get a foreclosure. You just don't have 
the ability to do these repairs until after closing most of the time. The bank's not going to let you go in and do things to the property, right? So you can't get your loan. You're going to need a construction loan or you're going to need like a rehab loan of some sort if you don't have cash. So talk, make sure they have talked to a lender about what kind of homes they're okay with. And I know right now there's like no foreclosures in the market, but I am saying in the next year, you are going to start seeing a few of these things pop up. So make sure you have qualified that buyer. Do you have any other questions about that loan process? So when you get to, uh, when you get to the point of writing the offer, you are going to feel, your buyer is going to feel that they are signing their life away, <laughs> really. So you write a regular offer, and then they counter you with like a 20 page contract that goes onto the back of the offer. And it says in this big piece of pay, the like contract thing, it's going to say, you got to strike all these things out of the contract that I don't even know if some of that, I was always questioning whether it was legal, they could do it in Colorado um, and or Idaho or anywhere. They'd like say, okay, got to write that offer over again. And you got to cross this thing out and then take out this. And then you have no right to do this. And and so then you're writing the offer again and you're trying to tell your buyers like, this is, you're not protected at all in this contract. I'm letting you know, you could lose your earnest money completely. So please don't put more than a couple thousand bucks down because I just, this whole thing is very scary. Um, so you feel like you're signing your life away. And then this 20 page thing that goes onto your contract says in it, we're not giving you a property disclosure. Um, if there's lead paint, we can't do anything. If there's meth, we can't do anything. Like it's basically saying, seller doesn't know anything about this property. And then in it, it also says things like, if you don't close on time, you automatically have to pay the bank. Like, let's say it's like 200 bucks a day. I don't know what it is, but the price of the home goes up every single day. Um, hopefully my internet doesn't go out. It's telling me it's unstable. So, okay, now it's back. Uh, so the price of the home goes up every day. So what if it's the seller's problem that you're not able to close because they couldn't get the house open for the appraiser. So the appraiser could go out there. It's still your fault if you don't close on time. So you got to structure your, your offer so that you know you can get everything done like weeks before it's supposed to be done. Because once you get close and you know the bank's going to stall, the uh, seller's agent's going to stall, uh, you can never ask for a change in that contract. Just know whatever you go under contract for, it's probably going to probably going to close for that price, right? So you got to structure it perfectly so there's no uh, mistakes in there or like things you can't do. Oh gosh, Hazel, no problem. I just saw your chat. Um, yeah, okay. So, and I'll, I'll tell you more about that, but, but when they sign this, you, you as an agent, you can't advise people on what is in a contract if it's not on our form. We are allowed to practice law in like a little bit way on our contract to buy and sell, our buyer's agency, our seller's agency, we can't advise them on this bank contract. So most of the people that I had who were buying foreclosures did not choose to go to a attorney. You absolutely have to advise your buyer. Look, I can't advise you on that. If you want to talk to an attorney, it's a really good idea to do that. Um, but I can read what's in here with you, but I can't tell you more than that. So I got to know what was in this extra 20 pages, but I couldn't like, I could show it to them, but I couldn't say what that means, positive or negative. I just had to know that they were like, cool with it. You know, we're going to roll with this. We're going to spend a couple of thousand dollars of your money and hope we can get it closed on time. And we're going to structure the deal so solidly that we know we're going to be able to uh, get you done. So there's no certainty. The lender must be local. Do not fool around with some out of area bank. Okay. That is just a must because you need them to be able, you need to be able to walk into that office and talk to that lender and be like, I've got a problem. I need this right now today and wring their neck if they're not doing it. Okay, so then um, I want to talk more about, I don't have many notes today. I'm just trying to remember all the things that happened. So in the contract, oh, one of the things that you need to write into your contracts, I have a clause for it if you ever get into the, a time when you need this, you have to tell them when they need to get the utilities on. So here's kind of th some of the things that I had to deal with. Uh, they, I would tell them the utilities must be on within five days of us going under contract. Oh yeah, so I'll tell you some stories too. 
So they, the utilities need to be on within five days of going under contract, including but not limited to, because you have to spell it out. I want the electric on, because there's no electric in these homes that's on usually. I need the water on. I need the gas on. Like you have to tell them these things. Now, usually a propane tank in Colorado, it, God help you, you, sometimes you get it on uh, central systems, but not usually. It's usually like septic and well. So let's say the person had been renting a propane tank. So that propane tank company stops being paid. They're going to come in and remove the tank. Okay. So you are buying a house with no propane tank out there and no way to heat the house. And you have to get the utilities on and you can't turn the water on in the middle of winter until you have a utility out there. The bank's not going to pay for that propane. So your seller, your buyer has to pay for a propane tank to be set there because like, you know, the, the truck comes and they sign the thing to have a small propane tank. Let's say it's 50 gallons, just enough and just enough propane in there to get you through inspections, keep the home heated while you're doing all these things. So you need to be able to schedule that right away. And then you need to be personally, you need to be standing there when all these contractors are going to keep coming in to test different systems. So I might say, okay, Bob, what, what day can you get the water turned on? Okay, well, I can get my guy. They always have their guys that they're going to turn the water on. So I got to get the propane connected. And then he's going to get, and he's never picking up the phone. I like knew his home phone number and I'd bother him at like 830 at night because I knew he'd pick up the phone. It was just like trying to get in touch with these people. So the propane tanks delivered, then he gets his guy that might be an hour late. So bring a book when you're meeting these people, they turn on the water and how many times you have the water guy there turns on the water and lo and behold, water starts coming out of the walls <laughs> or the ceiling or something. So then they got to turn it off and say, okay, we got a problem. And so then they got to get like the plumber in there and try to figure out what's going on. Or you just have to be able to buy it without the, the plumbing on because there's no, and at that point you've lost the deal if you have a conventional loan. Like there's no way you're going to get this house closed if the pipes are frozen. But this is the kind of struggle I, I dealt with. And then if you have a loan where let's say you can't have any health and safety issues, forget about it because the, there's things that are pulled out of walls. If the buyer thought they could get, or seller thought they could get some money, seller meaning if the person who used to own the house thought they could get some money for a wall baseboard, they'll pull that out too. So here's all the things that you might find. And then I did get some closed with loans, obviously, like people have loans. And I remember even when you think the house is doing pretty well, you'd have like right at the end of the contract, you'd have the seller say, or the, uh, the appraiser would say, you know, there's some water in the crawl space. We really need a sub pump in order to close. And I'm like, oh, the bank's never gonna like let you have a sub pump, right? So I would have to call and I shouldn't throw anyone under the bus because it's not legal, but like sometimes we'd have to tell the listing agent, I'm not doing anything without the listing agent's permission ever. I'm never going behind the listing agent's back, but he knows he represents a bank and the bank is going to say, no, you can't change things for on this house because you don't own the house. But they would say, I didn't know you went in there. Just go, just go do it tomorrow and let's get closed on Wednesday, right? So we'd have to like go out there, get the sub pump put in the house, take a quick picture of it, send it to the appraiser, close on Wednesday, and that's how you get it closed. So these banks, you have to remember, first off, you're never going to insult them with a low offer. It's a nine to fiver who's answering it. It's not like, like Todd was saying, the little old lady, the little old man who've owned their house forever. These are banks. It's an investment. It's a nine to fiver who's making the decisions on these. But it generally takes when you're structuring the loan uh, up to four days for them to get back to you. And I'm business days, right? So I'm writing a loan. I really want this, or not loan, uh, offer. I'm writing the offer on a Wednesday. I'm, oh my gosh, they're so excited. They want to know, hear back. And I keep calling. I keep calling. Have you heard anything? No, nope, no. Nope. So maybe my, the realtor took a full day to get it to the bank. Not surprising. Like they're not great realtors all the time. So they send it to the bank and then it takes like two days for them to get back to you. And they're like, no, nope, we're not going to take your offer. Well, what aren't you taking? Like, could give me some feedback. No, nope, we're just not taking it. I'm like, I guess it's the price, right? So let's try a different price. Um, or they would uh, just counter you and it would be at a specific price. So that's again, why you have to structure 
the offer, like he might say, you have to close in 30 days. And you're going, oh my God, like how are you going to close in 30 days? You just have to, so 30 days from whenever it goes under contract or 30 days from when you write the offer. So you're just trying to like guess and you you really want to be, when you start learning who these people are who might represent banks, be on their good side so they can help you over the phone. Look, my guy isn't going to take any less than this and he needs it to close in 30 days. Whatever he tells you, like I'd say he, because it was he's back in the day, put it in the offer. Like, and then if you have the buyer who's going, I don't trust him. He's just lying to you to get a better price. It's like, if you want to play that game, fine. But if you want this house, we really do have to listen to this person because they've worked with Wells Fargo for 20 years. They, they understand. Okay. So it does take a long time. And then if you actually have a problem during the contract where the lender needs something to happen, your lender needs something to happen and you need an additional few days, it's going to take you two days to get that done. So when you're like to get the extension and they usually never sign extensions. So all of these things while you're under contract, they're so free flowing. And you know, in a regular contract, a regular buy and sell, you have so much anxiety about deadlines, right? You have to get things done by the deadline. So in a foreclosure, you have, let's say 10 days to do all your inspections, 10 days from the day it goes under contract. And let's say it takes like six or seven days to get the utilities on. So you, everybody has to be ready. I am ready to go. We got the gas. We got this. We got everything going. Okay. Well, um, so they, you know that you need your inspections done by that certain day. And the bank's not going to fix anything almost always. They just say, take it or leave it. Or if you need a price reduction because there is water pouring out of the walls, you might be able to get it. Um, but then all these other deadlines that you're usually so anxious about, the loan, the um, due diligence, whatever it is you usually do, it is like free flow. You're going, oh my God, we haven't even gotten this paperwork from the bank yet. And our deadline was like two days ago that I was supposed to respond about it. So your people just have to be super chill and be like, that's cool, man. I just want the house. So you can see like how much you get used to this. But if you have the right buyer, that's like, it's all cool. We're either going to buy it or we're going to lose a few thousand bucks and we'll walk away. You know what I mean? So you're not going to have like a 10 or $20,000 earnest money on the line. It's going to be a few thousand bucks usually. Um, and, and usually the banks were pretty good about not keeping people's earnest money. Usually. I don't know that I, anybody ever gave, actually gave up their earnest money to walk away. Banks usually don't want the bad, rep, believe it or not, they don't want the bad reputation of having angry people out there who lost their earnest money. They're going to make money on the foreclosure. They don't need to be taking your earnest money. So even when things are free flowing and it's getting near closing. And as long as you're by, you know, your inspection date was on time. If you just say, look, I, they, it's just not going to work out for these people. They couldn't get the loan. It might take a long time to get the earnest money back, but generally speaking, it was cool. And we got our few thousand dollars back. So that wasn't something that I was constantly worried about. Um, no certainty. Yep. There's absolutely no certainty when you do a foreclosure. So must be local. Okay, let's talk about, oh, before I get into that. So for you as an agent, there's a lot of running around. Uh, utility clause, I talked about that. Getting all the utilities on is a must so that you can get it appraised. I always thought utilities were only for um, worrying about, hold on, I'm losing my Zoom. I thought utilities were only something you had to worry about for inspections. I didn't realize you needed it for appraisals too. The heat needs to be on. And then the the heat needs to be on and then the water needs to be on. They have to prove that there's hot water and it's habitable if you have a loan, okay? So some of these, some of the banks would say, we're gonna turn the utilities on so that you can have an inspection, but then we're gonna turn it off again. And I'd see, but we need it on for the, the appraisal. And so they'd say, okay, then we'll you tell us when the appraisal happens and we'll turn it back on for that. You're talking about the middle of winter, you know? Um, we'll turn it back on from that but then we're turning it off and we're draining the pipes again. You know, we're winterizing it again. So they might even winterize it like a couple of times during this period. And you're like, it's just so much money to have to do this. It's probably not great for the pipes either, but you're doing it because you just want to get it. Uh, you just want to get it closed. So whatever, you just make sure you write all these things down and you go, okay, I know there's something about uh, making sure the hot water is on for the appraisal and you, you have to, hope that everybody that's working on the deal is a team player and they're just willing to do it. And these, these foreclosures are in the middle of nowhere. I can't tell you how many times I was up in Tween Lakes or Vicedo or 
forest lakes at the top of the subdivision in the winter, like shivering, like waiting for the people to arrive. And it just is what it is. So uh, utility clause must be on for appraisal. Okay, pre foreclosures, let's talk about that. I'm actually gonna talk about that last. That's not, doesn't have that much to do with it. So let's talk about making offers. All banks are different. There is a little chart that exists for every bank. Bank of America versus Wells Fargo versus somebody else. And that chart that probably is on their wall somewhere says, we start listing, what they do is they get these BMAs. They're like uh, brokers market analysis or like price opinions, right? BPOs. So a couple of different agents have said, I think it's worth about 350. They, they probably didn't even go in the house. They probably just drove by and did a little market analysis. The bank decides on what they're going to put it on the market for. And they're usually a little cheaper than a traditional home would be on the market. So then um, their chart will say, if no one writes an offer after 10 days or seven days or five days, it's usually a lot longer than that. We lower it X amount and it's a percentage, right? And then if someone makes an offer, on day six, we'll accept this price or this percentage off. But if they make it on day seven, it might be a different percentage off. So it's like all on a chart. And you're not going to tell the bank that they should accept less on that day because it's not on their chart. You know what I mean? Like that's how not offended these banks will be about your lowball offer. It's on the chart. It's going to work. And if it's not on the chart, it's not going to work. So the longer they're on the market, the cheaper they get. And there's usually enough activity, even when in, during the foreclosure crisis, that unless the house, I, I saw a house that was literally half of it, not half of it, a third of it was falling off because of mold. <laughs> so it was $100,000 and we were out there and I was with, um, I was with a couple and you know one of them very well, I won't say who it is, um, but one of the people who was my client at the time, we were trying to figure out, could you just put a big wall there and like let the rest of it go and just live in part of it because it was like one moldy section of the house. So they're like, they're really in, in terrible uh, condition, but just know that uh, the bank does not care. Like I've had some, you walk in and you open the closet and the mold is like these big, like it's just so gross what you see in foreclosures. And you just have to like, it's cool, man. We're just going to see if we could do anything about this house and we could just get it fixed after closing kind of thing. But um, know that they're not going to be offended by your loan off your low offer. Um, a lot of times they're in terrible disrepair, but there are people that want these houses unless it's the one who that did, you know, there were a few out there that I'm not even going to tell you the stories. They were just really disgusting and it'll ruin your day if I tell you the story. But like, let's say it's like the moldy house. There are going to be a lot of people that go up there and go, I, I can do paint and spackle. I can replace a fridge. I can replace the heaters. I could even deal with some water in the walls, but I'm not going to deal with mold. So there's, everybody has like that limit. Uh, so most of these, there would be a bunch of buyers looking at them, but it's like, I don't know if I want to buy that or not. So you aren't going to just wait 45 days for the price to come down. You, you really do want to, you see the right property, do make an offer and, and make a move on it is what I'm trying to get at. So that's how they come up with their pricing uh, strategy. It is just a chart on the wall. Bank doesn't care. Oh, sometimes there's, I, I forgot about that. It's been so many years. Sometimes there's a clause in the bank's documents that say they will not take an investor for a certain amount of days. So like the first, and I remember how cool that was because I was always working with first time home buyers. There'd be something in it that for the first 30 days, maybe it was 15, I can't remember. I think it was 30 though. Um, no investors were allowed to write an offer. They wanted only uh regular buyers and sellers. And if you happen to be a first time home buyer, they'd even take a few thousand more off or they'd give you a credit at closing or something, maybe like a couple grand. Uh, so that's super cool that they're, they actually were trying to, it was probably because they had done such bad things during the foreclosure cr crisis that they were trying to make up for it in the public's eyes. Uh, so yeah, sometimes they're a deal for first timers. So don't be shocked if you were to call and say, I'm writing an offer, and they go, well, are you an investor? That's why, because, and you're not going to go lie about that if you're an investor, like, that's bank frauds, or loan frauds, so you don't want to do that. Okay, um, I'm going to talk about pre-foreclosure, and then sort of wrap up, and see if you guys have questions, and again, this will all make sense when you actually see one. H how do you know it's a foreclosure? It's going to say, in the MLS, you're going to know, because it's a, I know three people who still do them, 
And I will tell you, there's a guy named Brett who has uh, been in real estate for, oh, at least five years, six years now. He's working under the fellow who did all the foreclosures back in the day or many of the foreclosures back in the day. And can I tell you, he's like the nicest guy in the whole world. So if he takes over the foreclosure world, people will be like excited to do a foreclosure because they will actually have an agent on the other side that gets back to you and communicates and it'll be much more of a pleasure than, um, than it used to be. So pre-foreclosure, there's different laws in different states. And I know the one in Colorado and what it says, I don't know if any of you have had a mortgage that you just forgot to pay. So I never did bill pay. I just like, I would have to write the check every month. And once in a while you got little kids or whatever, and I just forget to pay it. So I would totally forget to pay it. And then the next month they, they don't send you the late bill, or maybe I'd miss it. And then the next month, you'd get the late bill and then you owe for the last month. If I had waited like 15 more days to pay that, pre-foreclosure. That's how quick pre-foreclosure is. It's forgetting to pay a bill and then you're late with the next one by a, a few days, okay? Like half a month. So people who are busy and they work in two jobs in Durango or whatever, it can happen a lot, maybe a little less now than it used to because of bill pay and things like that. But it happens all the time that people are considered free foreclosure and there is nothing wrong going on with them. They are not going into foreclosure. So now I've explained that to you. So what if I was that person and I've got a little baby at home and I forgot to pay my bill and um, I'm just going to pick on someone. I'm going to pick on Todd or pick on Hazel. You gave me a call. And you said, hey, I have a buyer for your home. I, I think you might be in trouble with your loan. Like how I would be so insulted if you called me, I'd be like cursing you out and be like, get the hell out. What are you talking about? Because I don't even realize that that was considered free foreclosure because I didn't get like, a, I might've gotten a notice from my bank. I didn't know I showed up on the Zillow website, right? So when your buyer is searching pre foreclosures on some website out there that claims to, uh, be able to help people find these free foreclosures, know what that actually means in your state and know that if they're asking you, like they're driving by somebody's home because it's in pre foreclosure because somebody's trying to make money off of it, Zillow or whoever, it's usually Zillow. Um, they drive by the house and they're like looking and, they're, and then they call you, Hazel, and they're like, Hazel, could you call? I have the phone number, I looked it up. Um, could you call them and ask if they're willing to sell their house? Like, oh my God. So no, don't do those things. If you wanted to, you can send a letter to everyone on the block and say, if anybody's willing to buy or sell their home, um, please call me. And then it happens to go to that customer, that person. That way they don't feel singled out by any means. But a lot of times those pre-foreclosures are not the deal. Um, does that make sense? So you hear someone say that word, it does not mean they're always. Sometimes it does mean they're in a pickle. Um, the, the ways you can you can get into the whole like, oh, I'm going to track who actually has a mortgage uh, going, a foreclosure going through things like that. That's, that's different. But I never did any of that stuff. I never like looked for the next one coming up. I mm -hmm. waited till it actually was on the market because it might take a long time for it to get to the market. But if you know the agents who usually have them, like this guy, Bob, I used to work with, he liked working with me. And when I would call him and say, hey, I'm thinking about going out to this house, he would tell me, you know, I got another one coming up. It's probably going to be a week or two. I'd be like, oh, where is it? Okay, oh, well, any more information you can give me? And sometimes he'd give me the address, but rarely. Usually it was like, I got another one. It's probably going to be between 200 and 215,000. And I'm like, can you tell me how many bedrooms it is? So you could get information from people if, you, um, if, if you're just friendly, right? So yeah, don't be calling the person and say, hey, I got to like out of the blue and- <clears throat> excuse me, and calling them, but um, you just get to know people and be kind to other realtors because it will always come back and they will always try to get your deal, especially in a multiple offer situation. If uh, God, can you imagine if that happened on a foreclosure and the agent likes working with you or you were kind to them in presenting it and not a jerk, like they might want to do more business with you and your buyer gets more deals done because of it. Uh, but that's it. I, I just... I think that out of all the homes that we used to go see in a certain price range, like in a lower price range, I bet, I can't imagine it was 10% of the listings. I bet it was 5% or less. It wasn't that many, but I was tracking foreclosures for a while before the county used to do it. 
And I remember there being a time when it would get up to eight or 9% of the actual, so the listings, it might only be a little bit of the listings, but I think there was a time when it got up to almost 10% of the sales in La Plata County for a short time, uh, because they just were a little bit more of a deal. And for buyers that were on the fence, they're like, you know, it's not perfect, but I could do something with this house. I could actually afford it. So it was, it was a good percentage of the market. I don't think those days will ever come back, but it's just something to have in your pocket so that you don't, it would be the worst if you put an offer in on a foreclosure and you run around like crazy for like three weeks and then your buyer doesn't understand that they can't extend it. They lose their earnest money and you just feel like you just wasted a lot of time. And then the buyer doesn't want to use you again because you didn't understand what was going on. So, so really that's why I'm teaching this class just to get it in your head, even though I am not saying by any means we're going to have another foreclosure crisis, hopefully never in our career. But can you, guys, can you think of any questions you have about the way it works? A quick question, Heather. So you had mentioned one of the clauses you use is, use is about utilities being turned on within five days of the contract. What other clauses do you put in there? I think that was it. Okay. I think, I, you know, I would, I would definitely put in the one. We have one in CTME. Uh, Todd, you aren't using CTME, but there's one that's loaded in our program from Distinctive that says something about if your lender doesn't get the funds to closing that you have like one business day to get it there. So you we're a tabletop closing state and Todd, you might not be, we are a tabletop closing state. So the closing is considered the signing of the papers and the money has to already have been at the title company. So we add the one that says you have 24 hours for your lender to actually, just in case the lender, sometimes you get these weird lenders that are like, no, we have to see the paperwork that was signed before we send the money, but then you've missed the deadline because the cutoff for the wire was 3 p.m. or something. So I would put that one in. Um, you know, I used to put in a clause. I don't know if it was the right thing to do, but I used to put in a clause. It's really long and I bet it's in CTME. If not, I can send it to you. Buyer, it's kind of like a buyer beware. You know what? I think lenders used to tell you, you can't have any clauses. I'm almost positive. They used to make me take a lot of clauses out because they wanted the buyer to have full liability for things. So I almost think that day after that, they would tell you to take that out. Um, but I would, I used to, even in my regular, what, cause I dealt with first time buyers, I would put a clause in there that was really long and it would say, buyer is aware that, uh, I, I don't remember if it was like broker can't tell you about these things, or if it just says buyer beware of these things. And it was, it was kind of a list of all the things you could possibly look for on an inspection. It went into mold and asbestos and, and, uh, uh, termites. And it was this long list, uh, land survey problems. And I loved it because let's say it was like seven lines long. And I tell my buyer, I never had a buyer that was upset by it, but they used to, I, I used to tell them, this is sort of a checklist of all the things you could get inspected on this home. So go through it and tell me if any of those things are important to you. And if so, we'll either have the inspector look out for it we'll tell them to make a special note or we'll get that certain person in there like the termite inspector. We don't really usually have termites in this area, but sometimes there is uh, radon, you know, those sort of things. But I think now that I'm thinking about it, I used to think Bob would send it back to me and say, take all the clauses out, except for the one about utilities. And then I had to add, I had to like strike things from the contract that made me really, you're not allowed to do that. Like you can't just strike things from the contract, but the seller's instructing you to strike it. So we would. Um, oh, and, and remember that part at the end of our contract, it says that if the seller doesn't close on time, you get a certain amount of money each day. You have to actually strike that whole thing from the contract too. They'll tell you what to do, uh, but there's certain things that had to be removed. So I think, Crystal, that they would not let you put any of those in there, except for the seller shall turn on all utilities, not including, but not limited to, and just the list by this date. Good question though. Anything else? 